This is 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God has truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one which, has, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who, complains to, who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or, or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. This is the word of God. Uh, I was reminded by our wonderful music director uh, that I forgot to invite children to head to kids' worship. There is a time of kids' worship. It is over in the fellowship hall. Um, I think they've already gone that way, but if your children are interested, ages three through second grade, uh, there's a wonderful time set aside for them to, to learn and grow. Um, with that, let me, uh, let me open us in, in prayer. Sorry about that. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you for the good news that it is true. Lord, we thank you that it is for us and that you give us this instruction, Lord, to challenge, correct, and train us in righteousness and to lead us towards yourself. I pray, Lord, as we look at your word, um, despite my own inadequacies, Lord, that your gospel would be clear to your people, that they might be strengthened in you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. One additional item I did forget to mention was that next week, uh, you all have the privilege and joy of having uh, Reverend Dr. Herb Ruby uh, bringing the message. He'll be joining us to, to, to share a message uh, from the Psalms, um, and I'm just grateful for, for having him back in this pulpit uh, to, to lead us in reflection on God's Word. Um, I'll be back next week, but I'm gone this week, um, so uh, just pray for me and my family as we're away on a time of uh, a short vacation. You know, it's important to recognize how something is designed in order to use it properly. Isn't that the truth? I'm doing a lot of home projects and renovations at the moment, um, and it's important to use the right tool for the job. You know, I remember for high school graduation, I was given a Swiss Army knife. Uh, it was my first Swiss Army knife. Um, oddly, my children have gotten theirs far earlier than I did. Um, <laughs> And I've been careful to train them how to use them. Um, but I was a high school senior. I, I had just graduated high school. I knew how to use this thing. I knew what it was for. And the first thing I did with it was I used it to open up a plastic package of another graduation gift. Um, and it slipped and I sliced through um, my, uh, my ring finger, uh, this, this part of the digit. There's still a scar there to remember it. Um, it actually sliced not only through the skin, but through part of the tendon, and I had to have surgery um, and several doctor's visits to make sure that my finger worked. In fact, for a couple months, we weren't sure that I was going to have full movement in that finger. I was not paying attention to what that Swiss Army knife was meant for. It was not meant for opening plastic packages. It was meant for whittling wood or cutting rope or some other similar activities. But what are you and I made for? What are you and I made for? You knew I was going to transition there, didn't you? From a certain perspective, you and I were made to love. We were made to love. And this isn't just true for some people, that there are some people who are loving and some people who are thoughtful. No, all of us were designed to love. Rene Descartes, if you any, have any familiarity with philosophy... I think he got it wrong when he said that human beings are fundamentally thinking things. Biblically, 
we are fundamentally loving beings. In our passage today, John continues in this theme we've been looking at of assurance. How we know that we are in relationship with Jesus. But he does it in this passage by exploring how our salvation works to change how we live. Or more precisely, how we love. What I want you to take away from today is that we can grow in assurance as we experience God conforming us to his pattern of self-giving love in Christ. By the way, I forgot to turn on my mic, so I'm going to switch mics. We'll start by looking at the command to love, then how we're designed to love, and how rejecting our design undermines our assurance. And then finally, how our assurance is strengthened as we see God's love at work in us. You know, given how much emphasis John has placed on God's grace in Christ Jesus in this letter, it might have been shocking to you to hear the scripture read for today. It seems to be all about what we do. And if we don't do the right things, we need to question our assurance of salvation. If we do the right things, we can have confidence. It can be a little bit confusing to hear what we heard today. To read the statement, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Especially since we know the reality that none of us can keep his commands fully. Any of you keep God's commands fully? My hand is way down low. I see no hands raised. That's a good sign. Uh, You're one step along that path. (laughs) The reality is that none of us can keep his commands fully. It's why we need grace. In fact, John himself has said that if we claim to be without sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth isn't in us. So what gives? How are these two statements compatible? I mean, they're they're like within just a few sentences of each other. How do they work together? Well, first, I don't want us to gut this statement of its power. It's important for us to wrestle with understanding what this means, and to receive the force of it. When John says in verse 6, whoever claims to live in Jesus must live as Jesus did, he meant it. He means it. We need to appreciate the force of the statement that how we live will testify to the truth or the falsehood of our faith. In Scripture, the idea of a Christian who rejects being conformed to Christ is unthinkable. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense in the letters of Paul. It doesn't make any sense to John. That our union with Christ transforms our lives. You know, in this church, we preach the gospel of free grace in Christ Jesus. We do it unashamedly. We do it without question. But there is a wrong way to preach grace. And the wrong way to preach grace is a cheap grace that comes freely and requires absolutely no response. A grace that saves without transforming. That is not the grace that we preach. That is not the grace of God's word. We preach a grace in which a person is united to Christ by faith. And he saves us freely and transforms us to grow in living lives that are pleasing to him. We preach grace that saves and transforms. Being united to Christ by faith, it impacts the whole person and the whole of life. And you know, we can know we are his as we see ourselves conformed to him. That's one of the evidences of God's grace at work in us. You know, the the Westminster Confession of Faith has this beautiful chapter on the subject of assurance. And I I meant to pull this out earlier. It's in chapter 18. And it has this, it's a beautiful passage. If assurance is something that you struggle with in your own life, I encourage you to read Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 18. It has beautiful words of caution, but also comfort. Um, And here's what it says. This certainty, this assurance, is not a bare conjectural uh, conjectural and probable persuasion grounded on a fallible hope, but an infallible assurance of faith founded upon the divine truth of the promises of salvation, the inward evidence of those grace unto which those promises are made, 
and the testimony of the Spirit of, of God, the Spirit of adoption and witnessing with our spirits that we are the children of God. In other words, there are various elements to this assurance, and one of those is that God is at work in us to change us and transform us, to obey his commands. But what are his commands? What are they? Well, I want to jump down to verses 7 and 8 for this, because John makes very specific what he means by obeying Jesus' commands. He says, Dear friends, better translated, beloved ones, the ones I love, I'm not writing a new command to you, but an old one. And I'm paraphrasing here. You've heard it. You've heard it before. Yet the command is also new, and its truth is seen in him, in Christ, and in you. That's a little confusing, isn't it? He says, I'm not giving you a new command, but an old one, yet I'm also giving you a new command, and these commands are one and the same thing. What's with that? Well, I want to give you an illustration. I want to show you a story from the life of John that helps us understand this. Um, it comes from the church father, Jerome, as he's dealing with um, witnesses that have been passed down from the early church, talking about John's uh, later time in life after he came away from, uh, from imprisonment. According to him, late in life, John was often even carried into the meeting of God's people, into the, the church, the synagogue. And without fail, he would give an exhortation to the church. And that exhortation would be, little children, love one another. Little children, love one another. There is no one in the New Testament, no New Testament author uh, that God has used to write his word who speaks more on love than John. When he talks about the command that is both old and new, he is clearly speaking of the command to love your neighbor as yourself. This command goes all the way back to Leviticus. It's in the Old Testament. When Jesus quotes, what are the two greatest commands? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That comes straight out of Leviticus. It's as old as time. Yet in Christ Jesus, this old command is completed, fulfilled, and made perfect. You see, it is both old and new. Old as time and new because it is perfectly revealed in our Savior. In John 13, Jesus makes the shocking display of washing his disciples' feet. It's one of those most beautiful passages in the Gospels. Um, following that act of him getting down with a towel and doing this servant labor, the lowest of servant labors, it's a representation of his self-giving love that he was going to, to work for them and going to the cross. He then calls the disciples to do the same for each other. He said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another. Do you hear him saying the old commandment and the new commandment right there? You could say, wait a minute, Jesus. Didn't you just quote Leviticus? You said it was a new commandment, but you just quoted the Old Testament. But there are two sentences there. Love one another, old. What's the new part? As I have loved you, so you also must love one another. An old command perfectly revealed and displayed in Christ. You know, nowhere is this command more perfectly obeyed than in Christ, who laid down his life for us. In going to the cross to bear the sins and shames of his enemies, that we could be atoned for and have a loving relationship with a heavenly father who gives himself for us. Brothers and sisters, do you claim to live in Christ? If so, that love, that love of Christ, it will progressively, increasingly shape you and your relationships with others. It will, because his love transforms. But you know, not only is this a command, it's also what you were designed for. That's the implication, uh, the full implication of John calling this an old command. 
He roots the command to love as Christ's love in the eternal character of God. We must love one another not only because God commands it, back in Moses and Leviticus, but because God is the one who reveals himself as a God of love, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast, what? Steadfast love and faithfulness. Again and again, he reveals himself to be the God whose chief and central characteristic is self-giving love. And, you know, that's important for us to understand as well, because when we talk about love, we can sometimes be careless in describing what love is. Because not only are we designed to love, but love itself is designed, meaning that God defines what love is and what it isn't. The the reason I have to mention this is because the world knows a distorted love a love that ignores sin, a love that affirms what is harmful rather than confronting it. Such love is not God's love. For Christ both confronted sin and forgave sinners. He both affirmed the value of the weak and the outsider and called on them to follow him. Both were loving. God's love is self-giving and other-centered and draws people inexorably to himself to find themselves in him, to find welcome among his people and conformity to his character. Anything less than that is not love as God designed it. So we are made in the image of this God of love. And this love, as I've described it, it is fundamental to God's character in a way that no other attribute is. Even God's justice and wrath against sin is derived from his love for his people and the creation. You know, this is all key to understand. This is really important for us to understand because if we're not careful, we can look at 1 John, see the standard of loving like Jesus, and either check the box, say, yep, got that covered, I love other people, I'm good to go, I'm assured, I'm doing the right things. Or, if you're particularly self-aware, you can say you can despair because you know how much you struggle with animosity, enmity, unforgiveness, and even hatred. But the problem is both of these reactions, checking the box, saying I'm good, and, um, and despair, They're both problematic because they both reveal that we've missed the point of this entirely. One is false assurance based on shaky grounds, and the other is self-condemnation based on relying myself instead of Christ. You know, but John doesn't want either of these reactions for us. Context matters. There have been these false teachers that I talked about last week. They've lied to the people that John is writing to, giving them false assurance by diminishing their sin, saying it's not significant, um, and thus diminishing their need of grace. But John says, no, you don't gain assurance by diminishing your struggles. You gain assurance as you are conformed to the very pattern of love which saved you. Jesus going to the cross for you. Our assurance is rooted in God making us like Jesus. It's his work, not mine. It's seeing the fruit of what he is doing in my life, helping me to love my neighbor as myself, where before I was self-centered and self-consumed. And when we see him doing that work, we can gain confidence. We can know we are his if we are becoming like what he designed us to be. Like the God who perfectly revealed his loving character in laying down his life for us. But you know, the flip side is also true. And much of this passage is presented as a warning. John gives a very direct warning to the people that if their lives and relationships are defined and shaped by enmity or hatred and strife, if they're defined by their animosities and their separations, by looking down on others rather than loving their neighbor, then they actually need to be careful about saying that they know Jesus because their lives do not evidence it. John writes um, in verse uh, 11, anyone who hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness 
and walks around in the darkness. They don't know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. That is a sobering statement for those who struggle with anger and hatred or those who look down on their neighbor rather than seeing their equal need of God's grace. You know, one thing that's interesting about false assurance, assurance which is grounded in my acceptability, my worthiness rather than God's love, is that it actually has the effect of feeding disunity and hatred. You know, we looked um, in our Sunday school class on the Minor Prophets, we looked at the book of Amos. Um, and you have in, in the book of Amos, you have this prophet writing to a people who go and worship God and are confident in their worship, yet oppress and harm and hate the weak. And he says, I hate your worship because it's not true. The reality is that they were engaging in false worship, the worship of idols. And something that false worship does is it actually harms our relationships. And when we worship a God who we believe accepts us because we're great, it will inevitably harm your ability to love your neighbor. You need to know your need of grace and the unalienable, free love of God in Christ in order to love your neighbors well. And when you struggle with loving your neighbors well, check your worship. Check the grounds by which you approach this table and the cross. And ask yourself, am I sitting at its foot as one who needs grace? Or am I elevated above it as one who deserves it? False worship will damage our ability to love one another. And I think that's why this is so important to John. When we root our assurance on our acceptability, it feeds our disunity and hatred. Rather than placing all people in the church at the foot of the cross, it creates a hierarchy of worthiness, leaving some lower and some higher. You know, I remember visiting an old historic church uh, down in Williamsburg, in the Williamsburg area. And one thing you can go into and notice when you walk into the church building is these super uncomfortable seats at the back and more comfortable seats towards the front and placards um, with the names of the various people historically who sponsored those various seats. I can see in there a hierarchy of worthiness and acceptability based on achievement, based on value. Some lower, some higher. Some higher. You know, Paul dealt with this in his instructions on the Lord's table, which we'll be celebrating later today. Um, he, he, when he confronted in, in 1 Corinthians, he, um, he dealt with a church that was, um, that was dividing over resources and ability. He condemned them for the way they celebrated the Lord's table because there were some who were wealthy and comfortable who came and ate and had a big feast and there's, there were those who came into the church needy and unable to bring their food with them and they went hungry. Their worship was based in their own worthiness, not in the worthiness of Christ. And that's why their celebration was meaningless and actually harmful because it did not reflect the true worship of God which sets everyone equally in need before the foot of the cross. John and Paul both say, no, you cannot despise one another or look down on one another. Your mutual love is, is what displays your kindness and is what displays the, your, your assurance of God's grace. It's what displays the, the work of the gospel in you, your kindness and humility displayed in service. That displays that you are God's children, not your self-righteousness, or piety. Uh, Char- Charles Hodge was a theologian from the 1800s, um, a wonderful theologian. I have a systematic theology book on my shelf. He wrote that it often happens that men are pious or holy without being very good. The religion expends itself in devotional feelings and services while the evil passions of their nature remain unsubdued. You know, a loveless faith clothed in the claim to be walking with Jesus is what Hodge exposes in that statement. And it's what John condemns here. You know, I've seen the effect of this pastorally. When a person holds on to hatred and unforgiveness, they inevitably struggle to know the experience of the grace of God. 
You cannot hold on to these things of disunity and hatred in the body of Christ and experience that assurance. But when we go through the hard work of extending forgiveness, of loving despite wrongs, there is a joy that follows of seeing God at work lifting the burden of hatred from our hearts. It's something that we can look back on and say, see, I couldn't do this on my own. God must have been at work helping me to love despite everything. When we see God work, it confirms the reality of his work in us in bringing us salvation. I love that joy. I've experienced that joy myself. And I pray the same is true for you. That's where we come to the very last thing I want to leave with you briefly. And it's a really just a reminder of what we've looked at throughout this sermon. How we are assured that God's love is for us is that we see his love at work in us. It's often been noted that different people will struggle with assurance differently. Perhaps there are some of you in this church who, this, the fact that I'm doing a sermon series on assurance, you're thinking, well, I, I don't really struggle with that. I mean, I'm, I, I know I'm a sinner saved by grace, and, and I know his love is for me, and I don't struggle at all. But I know for a fact that there are others of you that struggle mightily with this, that struggle with knowing that the love of God is for you. And it's often been noted that different people struggle with it differently, with the heartfelt knowledge that God's grace is for us. Assurance for me is rarely a struggle at this place in my life, but that hasn't always been the case. But for some, I know and respect it is a frequent struggle. Struggling with assurance of God's love, I want to remind you, is not a sign of weak faith. And confidence is not necessarily a sign of strong faith. The presence of struggle itself is not a sign of whether or not a person has received God's salvation in Christ. Assurance is not the same thing as salvation. Someone can struggle mightily with assurance. um, But that doesn't mean that God has not saved them. For our salvation is not primarily founded on what we do or feel. It's not founded at all on what we feel, but on what Christ has done for us. And we can see it by what he does in us. But God's transforming work in our hearts and lives, it is designed to have the effect of assuring us that God's love is for us. And this is not fundamentally about resting in my good works, but rather seeing the evidence of God's work in me, his renovating, transforming grace, in bringing change and softening my heart to those I previously looked down on and despised. And brother and sister, if you're struggling with anger or hatred at this moment in your life, bring those struggles to God. Bring them to him. Ask him to work in you. And as he does it, as he changes you, be reminded that that is meant to show you that his love was for you all along. Experience his grace in changing your heart and so prove that his work is real. Our Father loves his children, brothers and sisters. Never forget that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your love for us is beyond our imagining. That you would reach out to people who had rejected you, who broke your law, broke your commands, and you would reach out to us in self-giving love by Jesus, you going to the cross in our place. It is beyond my fathoming. Help us to be so transformed by that truth and the loving relationship we have with our Heavenly Father that we cannot help but extend love in this church. For, Lord, we long to be known by our love for one another. We long for people to see in us the true love of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.